Welcome everyone to the first session of a, a series I'm calling Relational Talmud. Uh, I thought for a long time about how I wanted to set this up and spend some time collecting some of my, my favorite stories from the Talmud. And I wanna give a little bit of an introduction, um, particularly for this session that'll kind of span the whole thing. Um, I'm not sure how long it'll go. I have at least probably half a year's worth of these going once a month or so. Um, sessions on stories in Talmud. But, uh, you know, just briefly, because I don't assume everyone is coming from the same, the same level of background and, you know, knowledge about what Talmud is and what, you know, what's in it. Um, very briefly about what it is we're, we're here to talk about. So the Talmud itself is basically an edited transcript of roughly four centuries or so of a really long study session. And uh, it's composed of two strata. There's the Mishnah, which was a collection of oral teachings set down earlier, roughly the early third century. And on top of that is Gemara, which sort of nominally is a, an elucidation of the, Mish the Mishnah, but it's really this lengthy, complex transcript of conversations, of debates um, that were launched and inspired by the Mishnah, but go in all sorts of different directions. And the cool thing about Gemara is Whereas the Mishnah is mostly halakha, it's mostly Jewish legal discussion, there's all kinds of additional stuff in Gemara. There's, you know, other notes and stories, and it it's, uh, understands itself as Torah Sheba al -Peh. So so literally Torah that's on the lips, something like oral Torah, as opposed to Torah Shebi Tav, you know, the, the written Torah with the, the stuff on the scroll in the ark. When the Romans destroyed the temple, so in, in roughly the year 70, the heart was ripped out of Judaism as, as it was you know, up to that point. It was unclear how the Jews would continue to, to maintain their covenant with God, to serve God uh, without that temple. And, and over the centuries that followed, the rabbis reshaped Torah. They, they reshaped basically written Torah to an extent through oral Torah. Um, and they did that in order to to thrive and to, to shape what we know today as, as Judaism. They developed traditions about sacred texts and religious practices and ethical values and customs and ideals that were flexible and authentically rooted in ancient tradition, sturdy enough to maintain, and they, they've maintained for 2000 years, and also idealistic enough to, to provide challenge and inspiration. So, what Talmud is, and it is for me, and I hope will be for us uh, in these classes, is, is basically a framework through which we can explore big questions and, and deep concerns in order to arrive actually really at our own answers. So within Talmud, we encounter a wide variety of discussions ranging from you know, complex legal analysis to folklore, to theological reflection, speculation, you'll get like discussions of civil law, criminal law, business ethics, and religious observance. And you'll get those like interspersed with uh, legal dictates about family relationships, uh, ethical dilemmas, relationships with non-Jews, advice to scholars, advice to community leaders. You even get things like recipes, uh, medical advice, magic incantations, strategies for avoiding evil spirits and some locker room, locker room humor all kind of rolled up into one. I think the, the Talmud is, is really thoroughly human and it, it sort of recognizes and acknowledges the realities of human life, um, our passions and our aspirations and our potential and charts a course for Jewish living. It's, it's the record of a struggle to understand the world and to understand God. My interest specifically, since I really first opened the Talmud and um, slogged my way through the, the portions that were halakha, that were Jewish legal discussion, I found that interesting, but ultimately unfulfilling. Um, partially, I think, because it felt like it unfolded in a vacuum. Um, the discussion, you know, very, it can be really, really interesting and, and complex, but sort of lacks that sense of how does this apply to the real world? So my interest has, has long been in the Agadah, which means stories basically like legends, the same root as since we're talking about Pesach, 
uh, the, the book we use on Pesach is the Haggadah. It's the story, it's the narrative, right? It's the retelling. So Haggadah gets a bad rap sometimes. The Halakha is kind of considered the serious part for serious students. But the Agada is where things get really interesting and the kind of abstract principles uh, collide with human reality. And sometimes the stories come and illustrate the point that was being made in the, the halakhic discussion. And sometimes they come and undermine the point that was being made in the halakhic discussion, but they always deepen the conversation. And I think by studying the stories and you know, folks who've learned with me before know I love to teach these kind of stories. Um, I think it's, it's a way we can discover ourselves a little bit more in them um, and shine light on our relationships and our challenges and dilemmas and our frustrations and successes. The stories I've selected for this course are some of my favorites uh, because they speak to relationships, I think, in deep ways. Um, and you know how I feel about uh, re relational Judaism, the, the idea that Judaism should have kind of an impact uh, or an influence on on every person at all the different relate, relate levels that they have relationships. Um, so we're gonna start with perhaps the most abstract, but also perhaps the most important. I think this is, today's session is really gonna be about uh, our relationship with God to a certain extent, and also our relationship with Torah. So the agenda for the night, and welcome everyone who's joined in while I've been giving my, my intro, Rachel and Deb and Kelly, welcome our agenda for the evening. Uh, first, I'll give you a bit of context for our passage, um, especially in this case, the background on a central character is gonna be really important. And we'll also talk a little bit about the context within the Talmud where the story appears, because that's also, I think, really crucial to studying these stories. They don't appear in isolation. They're, they're inserted at very specific points to make a specific point. And so the context that, that this one is in, um, I think should affect our reading and interpretation of it. Then we'll read the story closely. It's short, like most stories in Talmud are. Uh, the details are a bit sparse, but that's deliberate. It means that every word is loaded with meaning. So we'll read closely together and then we'll continue the conversation with um, you know, what I think are some key questions. Um, questions that don't necessarily have firm answers, but are, are interesting to think about in discussion. I hope you'll throughout all of this, uh, not only ask questions to, to clarify your own understanding of what's going on, but, but also ask questions about what everything means and don't expect clear answers from me because this is a, this is a game without clear answers. Um, please also you know, be confident enough in your own readings to volunteer ideas and, uh, and suggest what, what some of these story elements might mean because I come here to learn too, and I, I really uh, enjoy learning from all of you as well. So make liberal use of that unmute button um, when you are ready. Okay. So to begin with, a little bit of context about our passage. Uh, if you read the notes ahead of time, we're going to be talking about a passage from the Talmud in, in the tractate called Minachot on, on 29b. And the story is not about Rabbi Akiva. He's not like the he's not the protagonist, I would say, but also the story is really about Rabbi Akiva. So we need to talk a little bit first about this guy, Rabbi Akiva. You've probably heard of him. Uh, when I mentioned to my family I was talking about Rabbi Akiva, they said, "Oh, we know that book. There's a children's book called Drop by Drop about Rabbi Akiva, how he, um, you know, starts at age 40 uh, as an illiterate shepherd, and you know realizes that if if drop by drop that that drips of water can wear away stone, while maybe even you know a guy like him can absorb words of Torah. So he learns his alphabet at age 40 and goes on from there to become one of the most the, the foremost sages of all time. At least that's that's the story told in Talmud. The accounts of Rabbi Kiva that appear in Talmud are pretty romantic. They're pretty romanticized. So it's it's kind of hard to separate what's historical truth and what is you know, kind of hyperbolic, uh, uh, you know, myth-making about him. Um, another big, uh, or another sort of uh, uh, way he's held up and idealized, um, and particularly his wife, and especially in um, very orthodox circles. Akiva went off to study for a long period of time and left his wife 
um, basically in abject poverty in the meantime, but she was very patient, waited for him to return with his 24,000 students. Um, that's now sort of held up as an ideal role for a, uh, the wife of a, a Torah scholar. Um, and that comes from you know, the legend of Rabbi Akiva and his life. Um, yeah, as I said, his successes and his importance are described in really hyperbolic language, probably a testament more to his significance than to accurate historical record. But his, his crucial contribution from what you could call an academic standpoint, I think, um, is something like he, he was responsible for the systemization of halakha, or perhaps the creation of halakha. So Rabbi Akiva developed sophisticated methods for the organization and formula, formulation of Jewish law through, through logic and through scriptural interpretation. There's a, there's a fancy like Bible studies word for this, which is hermeneutics. Rabbi Akiva developed the rabbinic hermeneutics. So, so hermeneutics are methods or, or theories of interpretation. Um, to accomplish exegesis, just explanation of the text. And these rules of the game, as I like to call them, became the, the foundation of rabbinic Judaism. So, so by sort of creating the theory, like shaping the theory, shaping the approaches to interpretation, what Akiva accomplished was to give the whole rabbinic project of interpreting Torah a, a framework and, and kind of some boundaries, I would say. Um, for an illustrative example, I want to show you another story. This is not the main topic of the story today, but I want to show you another story about Rabbi Akiva. One moment. I have a question. Oh, please go ahead. When did he live? Um, so he was a either first or second generation Tana, which may not mean anything to you, um, but he would have been alive during the second temple period and probably immediately just after. I would have to look up and double check his dates. Okay. But he's very that's, he's very early. Yeah. Relative that's to the other rabbis you wrote it. Yes. Okay. Let's see. Okay. So here's a, here's my illustrative example. And in order for this, even the example to make sense, we have to go one step before that. Source number one up there on, on the screen is the very first, the very first verse in the Torah. Which reads, perhaps, uh, perhaps you've memorized it. Bereshit bara Elohim et hashemaim ve'et ha'aretz. Now, a lot of folks have translated this as "In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth." This, uh, the translation here is is the newer uh, JBS translation, which I think is a good one. When God began to create heaven and earth, the key thing in here, and I've bolded it in the Hebrew. There are two Hebrew words there, et, uh, et, et hashemaim ve'et ha'aretz. In Hebrew grammar, we call, we call et the definite direct object marker. It is not a word, it's, it's a marker. It points at the direct object of the, of the verb. So in this case, bara created. What was it that God created? Hashemaim, the heavens, and Ha'aretz, the earth. So you don't translate the et at all. It doesn't on its own mean anything. It's grammatically important, but not actually translated. So there's a story about Rabbi Akiva and his ability to interpret even, you know, uh, these elements of Torah that otherwise appear, you know, meaningless, uh, untranslatable, like these ets. So source number two on your, uh, on your screen right now is from Bereshi Traba, which is a collection of uh, Midrash, rabbinic stories about uh, the book of Genesis. And in this Midrash, Rabbi Akiva's, um, his foil, basically, the guy he's always sort of set up as arguing with, Rabbi Ishmael, asked Rabbi Akiva, he asked, what's your opinion on the et written here? What is it? Rabbi Akiva replied, if it's stated, and here he's deliberately leaving out the et, if it's stated, Bereshit bara Elohim shemaim ba'aretz, we might have said that the heavens and the earth are also divinities. Rabbi Akiva then continued by citing a verse from Deuteronomy later, for this is no empty thing for you. 
And if it seems empty, empty to you, then it's because you don't know how to interpret pr correctly. But et hashemaim, et the heavens, this et expands to include the sun and moon, the stars and planets. And et the earth, this et expands to include the trees and grass and the Garden of Eden. So for Rabbi Kiva, even that little two letter particle, et, the untranslated definite direct object marker, conveys this whole world of meaning. It actually serves to, to tell us more about God's created power. It's not just that God created the heavens, but it, you know, he takes it to mean the heavens, including the sun and the moon and the stars and the planets and the earth, including all the trees and the grass and the garden of Eden as well, all wrapped up there. So Rabbi Kiva made the enterprise of creating, creating halakha, creating Jewish law, but really creating normative Jewish living. He made that process expandable and, and flexible and uh, applicable throughout changing circumstances and according to changing needs by having this really incredibly creative approach to reading the Torah, to take words that otherwise like actually don't have a meaning at all and to find meaning in there. Br just brilliantly creative. For Rabbi Kiva, you know, the Torah's, the Torah wasn't just a book. It's, it's more like a process. It's a process of reading and interpreting. And I think he would have understood it as actually discerning God's will in response to whatever question or situation or, or dilemma is confronted uh, in is, is confronting us. You know, in, in, you know, in this case, it's Ishmael saying, how, how could there be a meaningless word in Torah? And Akiva says, there, there isn't, there's nothing meaningless. Um, you know, and, and in that way creates kind of a, a hermeneutic, a strategy for reading that, that is actually really fundamental to, to rabbinic interpretation, which is basically that there isn't anything superfluous. There isn't anything meaningless. You can always, every little, you know, uh, vowel, every letter can be interpreted and, and there can be meaning found in there. Okay. Quick pause for questions. What questions you have about Rabbi Akiva so far and uh, or about this Midrash? We're doing okay? Wonderful. Okay. So our story, our, so our story about Rabbi Akiva, which I said, as I said, he's not the protagonist, but he's an important part of the story comes in the context of tractate Menachot. So Menachot is, there are many, many uh, what they call tractates or, or Masechtot in Talmud. And they're organ all of them are organized into one of six um, starim, one of six orders. So Menachot is in the order that's, that's called Kiddoshim or holy things. And the story comes in the context of, of a discussion of a Mishnah that that stipulates that if if even a little part of a ritual object is found to be defective, then that invalidates the whole thing. So for example, if one letter of a Torah scroll is is pasul, if one letter of a Torah scroll is unfit because it's been smudged or erased, or it was written wrong or something like that. Uh, if even one letter of a Torah scroll is pasul, that makes the whole Torah incomplete. And so that makes the entire scroll pasul, you know, can't be used uh, for public reading until it gets repaired. So the implication from that discussion, before we get to our story, is basically that, the, you know, the written Torah as we have it is complete perfectly so, right? Perfectly complete, such that if you take even one letter away, it's no longer complete. Makes the whole thing, you know, somehow somehow unusable. So leading up to our story, the Gemara uh, recites a, uh, relates a claim that God actually explains certain details to Moses that weren't explicit in the Torah. So there's sort of two things going on. First, we have a claim that the Torah is complete and everything is in there. It's followed by a claim that actually God gave the Torah to Moses, but also sort of explained some stuff beyond that. And there are more, there are several different examples given, but here's a really uh, good one. It's source number three. For example, 
we read in Numbers 8, verse 4, it says, uh, this is how the lampstand was made. And, and you know, lampstand is, is menorah. This is how the menorah was made. It is that, you know, the, the, the menorah, the candelabra that was in there inside the Mishkan. So this is how the lampstand was made. It was hammered work of gold, hammered from base to petal, according to the pattern that yud heh vav -Heh, that's God, had shown Moses. So was the lampstand made. So if you have just this verse, do you have any helpful information on how to actually build a menorah? No. <laughs> Apparently, God showed Moses the pattern, though. It's not actually in the Torah. There's no, there's no blueprint. There's no, uh, you know, illustrations accompanying the text uh, that actually show how to make the menorah. But nonetheless, we know that there was a menorah. You know, it's, it says that God, you know, Moses built one. So how did Moses know how to build it? God showed it. God showed uh, Moses the pattern. There's several other, uh, several other examples too that are a little less on the nose than this. But basically, the implication of the, you know, this element is there's more than Torah that meets the eye. Torah is at the same time, or perhaps one or the other, perfect and complete such that any missing piece will invalidate it. And also there's more going on than meets the eye. There's, there's more Torah than, than just what's written there. But if we don't fully understand the depth of Torah's meaning because there's more that we haven't discovered, like you know, if we, if we don't understand how to build the menorah because we don't understand what the blueprint looks like, does that make our existing understanding of Torah pasul? You know, like like as if we're missing letters. If we're if we don't understand it all, does that mean our understanding is is incomplete and therefore unfit? Like that like that Torah scroll. This was the big question, and this is kind of where the the story the story comes in to deepen that discussion. So, what might this mean for? the whole rabbinic enterprise of, of enlarging and expanding on the meaning of Torah and applying it to new situations, as we know um, that they were wont to do. You know, Moses certainly couldn't have known or foreseen everything that would happen and all the ways that the Torah would be applied. So what would Moses think if he knew what became of the Torah in the hands of the rabbis? So this is where we get to our story. And um, I would love for someone else to help with the reading. Um, my voice is getting a little tired. Um, here's our story. I would love to have one person who's willing to read and that I can periodically press the pause button on. Um, so is it, if there anyone who would, who would mind volunteering to be my out loud reader, Jean. I don't mind. You're the best, thank you. So um, yeah, go ahead and read and I'll, I'll let you know when to pause. Do you want me to start at the top? Please do. Rav Yehuda says, in the name of Rav, when Moses ascended on high, he found the Holy One, blessed be God, sitting and tying crowns on the letters of the Torah. Moses said before God, Master of the universe, who is preventing you from giving the Torah without these additions? God said to him, there is a man who is destined to be born after several generations, and Akiva ben Yosef is his name. He is destined to derive from each and every thorn of these crown mounds upon, I'm sorry, uh, thorn of these crowns, mounds upon mounds of halachot. Okay, I'm going to pause you right there, Jean. Thank you. So, so the scene is, is set in heaven. So Moses has climbed up Mount Sinai, right? And not only that, but actually ascended to heaven where God is, is like putting the finishing touches on the Torah. This is like the moment before you know, the, the revelation at Sinai happens. And apparently God is in no particular hurry to give the Torah to Moses and is affixing these ketarim, these crowns. They're also called in Aramaic tagin, which you may, it may be a, a more familiar, tagin, uh, same, same word, it means crown in Aramaic. God is affixing these crowns to the letters. Now, if you've ever gotten the chance to look inside a Torah scroll, you know that the way that the script looks, it's written with, small little decorative flourishes um, in the Sefer Torah. So here's, a, here's an example. If you look closely at that Hebrew writing, you can see that some of those letters have those, uh, well, they call them crowns. They're like little little tiny lines sticking out of the top of the letters. And some of the, like here on the, the final nun, uh, here on this nun, here on the shin, 
Uh, these these lamids also have you know little decorative marks as well. So they're they're little decorative flourishes that are found in the writing in a Sefer Torah. So why is God doing this? Why is God bothering to you know spend this extra time as it were to to put these letters on? It's because of this guy Akiva, Akiva ben Yosef, Rabbi Akiva, basically to enable Akiva and and you know him and future generations to extend the teaching of Torah uh, uh, beyond just the plain sense of the words, right? To to have little things like those ets uh, in the, that first verse and the little crowns, all the little decorative flourishes that Akiva can expand on. So we have you know, here, here a statement, uh, you know, sort of a poetic statement of the principle we, we got from the context. Every little part of Torah is meaningful, right? As long as it's properly understood and it's, and it's properly interpreted. As I said, this is key to rabbinic understanding. There's nothing redundant, right? Everything, everything comes to teach us something, even those little tiny crowns. Okay. Does that make sense? Any questions, questions so far? Please do speak up. All right, in that case, Gene, uh, Moses said before God. Go, go ahead and keep reading. Thanks. Moses said before God, Master of the universe, show him to me. God said to him, turn around. Moses went and sat at the end of the eighth row in Rabbi Kiva's study hall and did not understand what they were saying. Moses' strength waned. Okay. Rab- oh, I'm sorry, I got to pause you again. <laughs> Thanks, Gene. Okay, this is one of my, this is one of my very favorite stories because it's uh because of the sort of magical element that's involved too it always reminds me of the the harry potter wizards who apparate and disappear and, and travel from one place to another god moses says like you know god sh- show him to me and god says turn around this this verb turn around as the, the hebrew says uh appears multiple times here and every time it does something unexpected happens here moses turns around and is somehow instantly transported to Rabbi Akiva's classroom, right? Now, here's my question. He ends up in the eighth row. Why, why the eighth row? What are your, what are your thoughts? Chet for life. Yeah, go, you can go ahead, Gene, please. Chet is eighth, is it not? Yes, it's the eighth letter of the alphabet. Okay. So I would think, given that this tends to be numerology based, there's some connection between the letter Chet and the position. I hadn't thought about that. If you can think of something, you may, you may be on a on a right track. A, a basically has a yeah, but I mean, we 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 see a Chet, and we often think of the rest of the word Chai for life. Hi, okay, sure. Yeah, it's definitely a, a meaningful number. It's it's seven plus one, right? It's it's uh, you know the seven days. It it's like the first full day of creation. Right. After the creation, right? It's also the day we circumcise baby boys. It's also a, a meaningful any, some of our holidays are eight days. Oh sure. Yeah. Okay. Any other any other thoughts from anyone else about why uh why the eighth row? Why not the first row? Oh, because people in the first row get all the attention. <laughs> Maybe eight. Oh, there you go. Maybe eighth was the final last row, and he was to be at the back of the classroom to watch and 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 listen and not participate. Hmm. So he could sneak in unnoticed, maybe. Not sneak in, but he's being told indirectly that he's supposed to just listen and watch. Oh, okay, okay, okay. I like that. Anyone have any any other thoughts? Why why the eighth row? Yeah, I thought something about along yeah. the same line, just that to blend in and not hmm. to stand out. Sure, sure. So so. Traditionally, the, the, the classroom hierarchy at, the, at this time, basically, the better students got to sit further forward and the weaker students sat behind. So uh, it's not clear if there were eight or 10 or, or 50 rows in class. But I think we're supposed to think this is probably, you know, the last row. I don't know how much further back you could get past eight and still here, right? It seems, it seems like Moses in the last row. And... Uh, and the story confirms that, in fact, Moses was not a good student. He didn't understand anything that Rabbi Akiva was saying. And his strength wanes. He's, he's feeling inadequate, I guess, or, or 
humble, you know, he actually gonna... hasn't even received the written Torah yet, you know, in, in theoretically in this story. Gene, were you going to say something too? I thought it meant he got bored. <laughs> he got bored, maybe so. Yeah. Don't understand anything, got bored. So somehow even, Mo even Moshe Rabbeinu is lost in Rabbi Akiva's lectures, right? Okay, let's keep reading. We're at uh, when Rabbi yep. Akiva arrived. When Rabbi Akiva arrived at the discussion of a certain matter, his students said to him, my teacher, from where do you derive this? Rabbi Akiva said to them, it is a halacha transmitted to Moses from Sinai. When Moses heard this, his mind was put at ease. Moses turned and came before the Holy One, blessed be God, and said before God, Master of the universe, you have a man as great as this, and yet you still choose to give the Torah through me. Why? God said to him, be silent. This is what arose in my mind. All right, pause there. So here, I think we get to the heart of the story. So what, what was it that Rabbi Akiva was teaching? He was... Uh... Okay, it's good that you're silent because it doesn't say. <laughs> oh. It deliberately doesn't say. It says it says he arrived at the discussion of a certain matter. It, it it was sort of it's sort of beside the point of the story. We don't know. Could be anything, right? Could be any sort of personal interpretation or opinion. But given what we know about Rabbi Akiva, it could be something really you know brilliantly creative, but very very specific. You know, like the specifically the ets in that in that verse. But what matters is its source, right? Where does he say it's from? That it was halacha given to Moses from Sinai. In other exactly. words, directly from God. Right. So it's 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 in the Torah. It's it's direct from God. It's it's in the Torah, and it's sort of implying it's already encoded in the text, right? It was in some sense already there at Sinai, waiting for someone to come and discover it and teach it. Teach it. You know, it doesn't necessarily mean it's explicit, whatever this is that Akiva is teaching, but it is legitimately authoritatively derived from the Torah. And, and this is what the, the enterprise of, of doing Torah, you know, sort of Torah as a verb of creating, you know, creating and expanding upon Torah. That's, this is what it's all about. So why, why was Moses relieved to hear that, do you think? Was, Margaret, he, was he worried that he was going to be supplanted by this wonderful teacher? Uh, maybe. What do you think? It sounds plausible to me. No, I think it's the opposite. Yeah. I don't think he felt that he was going to be supplanted. I think it's more, why are you giving it to me instead of to him if he's so great? But that mm. doesn't explain why his mind was put at ease. Okay. What do you think? Why, why would knowing that Akiva is, you know, well, oh, Lisa, please. Well, I was thinking he was saying, well, he's going to get this straight scoop from, he's expecting to get all of the answers from, from the Holy One. Right. It's like, right. like I'll get the answer here. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So you, He's at ease because he thinks the following question is going to get answered. Is that, is that what you're mm -hmm. suggesting? Which, of course, it doesn't. Right. Well, we'll, talk about, we'll talk about that in a second. Yeah. What if his mind was put at ease, not because it came from Rabbi Akiva, but Rabbi Akiva acknowledged that it came from God? I think I think that's it. I, that, to me, is what, I, is what I'm thinking. Lynn, I saw you pop off of mute to, for a second there. What did, what did you think? Same thing. Ditto. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah, I think I think Moshe kind of knows his place. You know, he he knows that things are going to stay on track. That this big event that he knows is coming but hasn't actually done yet, where he is the transmitter of written Torah to the Israelites. He knows that that's going to be, you know, sustaining and ongoing and and real. You know, that that revelation, the revelation that he's going to help mediate is going to be loved and venerated and not you know dispensed with you know this isn't akiva crediting himself right the the, the future leaders of, of 
the Jewish people aren't going to be, you know, so self-centered that they're going to say, oh, I made this up myself. They say, no, this is actually, this goes all the way back to Torah, Torah, uh, to Moses at Sinai, right? That, I think that's what's going on here. So where does, where does Moses, where does Moses's question come from then? You know, he's like, okay, you have, you have Akiva, what do you need me for? How does Moses see Akiva? He sees him as a very great and smart person. Great. Wise. He sees him as a wise person. Perhaps wiser than himself? Possibly. I, he I sounds like he's humble. Yeah. Lisa, what are you going to say? Yeah, please. Well, I'm just reminded of... of Moses's original resistances oh, to, yeah. you know, a, a man no, no, of circumcised, don't choose, don't choose uncircumcised me. lips, you know, of not being a great communicator. Sure. And, you know, here he is seeing Akiva communicate very eloquently to his students. Yeah. That yeah. in a way <laughs> that Moses does not understand. <laughs> right. Yeah. I, I mean, I think that's, that's on brand for Moses, right? Like he he has the reputation of being humble. I think it makes sense that there's some element of like, yeah, this guy is better at this than me, mm -hmm. right? I, it's also kind of chutzpahdik though, right? Like he's like, God, maybe you're doing this wrong. <laughs> what do you need me for? Like, that's actually a pretty bold claim to even come before God and say, yeah, he, He's up in heaven with God right now, or sort of. That's where he was. It got, evidently, God is still there too. And he's like, uh, you know, maybe you're screwing up here. And what's what's God's answer? He's silent. Don't ask that question. What what do you make of God God's answer here? Oh, God. why does God answer that way? It's okay. We'll double back to this because it's going to happen again. Let's, re let's read to the end. Gene, would you mind? Moses said before God, Master of the universe, you have shown me Rabbi Akiva's Torah. Now show me his reward. God said to him, turn around. Moses turned and saw that they were weighing out Rabbi Akiva's flesh in the marketplace. Moses said before God, Master of the universe, this is Torah and this is its reward? God said to him, be silent. This is what arose in my mind. Okay, so one of the things I love about some of these rabbinic stories is the way they take these bizarre, like sometimes gory turns and then leave things utterly unexplained. So <laughs> Moses assumes, quite naturally, I think, that, that a marvelous teacher like Akiva is likely to be rewarded for this great teaching in some fashion, right? Now, of course, this is ironic because we know that Moses himself is not rewarded because he's not allowed to, to enter into the land of Israel. But Moses, you know, may not know that yet. But, uh, you know, not rewarded here is an understatement. So this story alludes to a different tradition in Talmud that comes from uh, Masecha Brachot, that uh, where Rabbi Kiva defies an edict from the Romans that's a ban on the public uh, public Torah study and teaching of Torah. And he goes and does it anyway, and he gets arrested and gets publicly tortured to death and martyred by the Romans. Uh, you know, his um, it happened to be the time for saying Shema, so he dies while he's saying Shema. And his students are like, Rabbi Kiva, you know, Rabbi, what are you doing? And he's like, I, you know, I never understood what it mean, meant to love God with all my heart and all my soul and all, all my might. And now I do as I'm saying Shema, as I'm, you know, being martyred for Torah. It's like super romantic. Um, but this is obviously an allusion to that, right? Rabbi Kiva, this amazing teacher, ends up being murdered for it, right? And Moses challenges God again. He's like, well, this is this is the reward for Torah? And God says, shh, don't ask that question. This is what arose in my mind. Okay, now how do you understand this this response from God? He's God's done it twice. 
Uh, Rachel, please. Saying, don't question my will. Okay, so is God being imperious? Is God uh, being, you know, just putting putting God's foot down? The theological question, I suppose, is it? I mean, that's kind of an anthropomorphism in a way. It's hard to, but but he's saying, you know, this is all part of my plan. Mm. And okay. You're questioning it is not going to achieve anything. Ah. Uh. Yeah, so I think that I heard a couple of different responses in there. Like, it, if God's not, you know, just being imperious, which I, you know, I don't, I don't think so. Um, yeah, maybe, maybe this is about some sort of plan. Uh, Leo, what, what do you have to, to add? Well, I just, it's not why God did it, but I was kind of noticing a parallel between what you said, Moses not being allowed to go in. So Moses wasn't sure. rewarded, and Akiva's not rewarded. Right. So they're some kind of parallel. They are two great teachers, and this mm -hmm. is this is the end that God chose for them, I guess. Right. I mean, God, I don't know. <laughs> I gotta, I gotta be honest. You know, the the rabbis come up with all sorts of explanations for why it was really an okay, why it was really justified that Moses wasn't allowed into the land of Israel, and it's like, oh, he killed that Egyptian guy. I mean, that one was clearly, you know, justified. Uh, he he hit that rock, right? And that's why he wasn't allowed to go. In, like, I've, I've done way worse things than hit a rock. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like that's supposed to strike us as unjust, as unfair. And I think the same thing with the Kiva here, that's supposed to strike us as unfair. So it could be, if it's not God just sort of being imperious, Maybe it is some sort of expression about, you know, there's a, there's hashkacha, right? There's divine private. There's a plan and we're just not capable of understanding it. I, so, have you know, a different, I think yeah. I have a different perspective. Okay, good. Because that's actually not what I think either. I, I want to let Anne though. Anne, you came off of me for a second. Yeah, uh, I was wondering if maybe it had something to do with that you have to do these teachings for themselves and not for the reward. Ah, yes. That's something we learn elsewhere too, that the Torah should be done lishma for its own sake, right? Yeah, it's not, Torah is not a guarantee against evil and against suffering, right? It's it's a source of wisdom and it's it's insight to cope with whatever happens to us, right? Jean, what were you gonna say? So I'm bothered by the choices of the words. This is what arose in my mind. Okay. And two things crossed my mind. First of all, sorry for the pun, not intended. <laughs> First of all, when this was written or the words chosen for the story, that may have been an expression that had a meaning that we no longer have. True. The second is I am reminded of my grandmother's perspective on God. She said, God wasn't, God doesn't decide what our future is. We have mm -hmm. free will. And God is a God of history. He looks at the past, the present, the future, all in one envelope. And what he does or doesn't do is based on what is historically relevant, not to any individual person in that history. And so something happening to Moses not crossing over or Akiva being murdered would not be of relevance to God's plan. Sure. Yeah, so that's, that's what I thought of. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So so the so the expression, I mean, this is a this is a pretty literal. Uh, uh, rendering of the Hebrew, like it literally says, this is what arose in my mind. Um, yeah, so, so I think there's definitely a way of reading this that's, that's, you know, you know, don't question my plan, right? There's a plan, you don't, you don't get it, and you don't, you don't get to try to get it. There's also, I think, you know, and this is, re this is related, like, a, it's not a necessarily a totally clear distinction. What, you know, sort of understanding the whole universe as the is the mind of God, as it were, then whatever arises in God's mind is whatever just happens in the universe, whatever happens to, be, to befall us. And it's not that God is a, you know, a micromanager or a, or a puppeteer, um, but, you know, rather inheres in all creation. And, and so, you know, the story, the, the rabbinic author who wrote this, when they say silence, don't ask that question. So that's the rabbinic storyteller saying, don't ask because that could lead down a dangerous path, right? To despair or to hopelessness. Like if, if you try to 
find explanations for all the suffering and evil in the world, you're either going to conclude that God is bad or that God doesn't exist, or you're just going to lose your mind because that's the way the world is, right? Out of curiosity, what word was used to be for be silent? Uh, it's, I think, shtika, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. So it is a, it is a, a variation of sheket? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. But shtika as in you will be silent? Shtika is just silence. So I uh, I would have to double check that, which I can't. So it's not, so it's not, an, it's not an imperative then. I think this is a fair rendering. I, it sounds like you have something in mind if it's not an imperative. Well, because Let's assume be, it's silent, not. be silent sounds yeah. like an imperative to me, sure. like a commandment. Yeah, yeah. But if he's just saying shh, which is what you've been enunciating, that's mm-hmm. not be silent. That's not an imperative. That's just saying, listen. Oh, okay. So I was, I was, my, that was my next question is what do you feel like is the distinction? <laughs> I think and the so, distinction so is one, one is you don't get to question and the other is listen for the answer. Listen. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. It's like you, you're being too, maybe you're being too active here. You're being too probing. I think it goes back to the eighth row. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I like that. I like that. Okay. So I think we end up, you know, regardless with this idea that that Torah is not, you know, being a great Torah, uh, you know, teacher is not going to guarantee that you don't, you know, not going to guarantee your reward. And that, you know, Torah ultimately is is wisdom and, and insight to cope with w- whatever the world dishes out. So I want to switch now. Now, now we've read the story. Oh, for, actually, first let's let's make a take a pause for questions uh, before we kind of continue the question the conversation. And I, I have some questions about you know the big the big relationship stuff that comes up out of this. But are there any other questions about understanding or things you want to uh, point to or highlight or ask about? Okay. So I'm curious what you all think. What does this story say about the nature of revelation? Like what what actually is revelation? Based on what you've, you know, what you feel like this story is saying to you. Well, I feel like it's saying that we're co-creators with God of the meaning. And that's one reason why the Torah is in a Mm. way complete. Because here we are with Rabbi Akiva. And we're discussing and interpreting and uh, bringing our own understandings to what was handed down to us at Sinai. Sure. Sorry, it's possible your audio like glitched or something there. Did you say that the Torah is incomplete? I'm sorry. You were saying the the first part of it, like of what you're saying. Did did you say? Did you suggest that the Torah is actually not complete? And that we are helping complete it. I mean, let's let's put it this way: it's very sparse in a yeah. lot. Of I, I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm just making sure I understand you. Yeah. So maybe incomplete isn't the right word, but it leaves room for us to question. Right. Okay. To yeah. Create meaning. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's definitely one of the one of the possibilities. Like, I, I think there's. I'm not sure the story is giving us a clear answer. But I think that's definitely one of the possibilities that, that God kind of builds flexibility into the Torah, I guess, by by leaving so much of the so much of the wisdom that's there, like that can be gleaned from it, I guess, by leaving so much implicit as opposed to explicit, you know, we get some some latitude to derive the wisdom that we need for our time and for our context, right? For what's called for. And you, you, you use the phrase, uh, you know, co-creators with God. So, like, r- would, you, would a fair summation of that be, like, revelation is, is progressive and ongoing? Yeah, I think so. And I think we're not supposed to just be handed Torah from Sinai and guy, go, sure. oh, okay, that's it. But instead, we're expected to sure. debate and teach and learn as, as is happening in, in the study hall. 
So I'm curious if you, Rachel, or anyone else feels like there's a difference between that idea um, that we are, we are like, a, a, um, yeah, like co-participants in the revelation. That's better than co-creator, co-participant. Yeah. Okay, cool, great. Um, so like, is there a difference between that, where we are co-participants and participants in the revelation and the idea that, that everything is already there you know, God, God has encoded all of the wisdom that will ever come out of Torah into, you know, all the little X and all the little crowns. And revelation happened once and is now complete. And everything we need is already in there, contained in Torah. And, you know, all we're doing is like decoding or unlocking or, or discovering. Does that feel different? And does it matter? Well, it's definitely different. In one, again, we're given a finished product and, and you know, it's, we're just decoding what's already there. And in another interpretation, we're actually adding meaning. Hmm. Oh, okay. Okay. So that's, so that's, that's significant there. Co-participation means in some way adding something. I think that's a, that's a fairly significant, uh, you know, significant claim. Okay. Uh, Anne and then Lynn. Yeah, which I think I agree with what Rachel was just saying because in at least in this translation here, it says that that he is destined to derive from each and every thorn. Mm -hmm. So, right to derive, to decode, to understand, to figure out what all of those meanings are. Right, and that it takes all of you know. He's um, Rabbi Akiva was the very learned person who was able to at least start doing that but that there's a lot of derivation that needs to happen. Mm. Okay, so, so your understanding derivation is specifically conveying that it's a participatory process, not just a decoding or, or unlocking. Okay, got it. Uh, Lynn. I'm not sure if this is different or building on, maybe parallel to, but in this passage, there's a lot about changing one's perspective or having one's perspective changed um, in the process of revelation. There's a lot of movement in this passage that's really interesting, turning around, being put yeah. in the eighth row. Mm -hmm. It's like you almost, you need to have your something moved or, or altered or within yourself or outside of yourself to oh. you're participating in that meaning making. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. I, that that feels like it split, like it almost splits the difference in a in a, in any way. Hmm. Leah, what what do you think? Well, I remember when somebody I don't know when or what it was taught me that um, it wasn't one or the other. Mm -hmm. It it wasn't that God knew everything and planned everything and whatever, and it mm -hmm. wasn't that the opposite, that we had free will. And it seems like I was told, and it felt somehow comfortable, that I had to hold both ideas. And I'm not sure what that means, but yeah. it always spoke to me. I think that may be where we're getting to, because re like remember the context that this is in, we basically had both of those, both of those ideas proposed that either everything's there and all we're doing is decoding, or that we're somehow participating. And then this story comes and says, maybe it's both. Maybe we maybe we don't get to know, and maybe we get to sort of try to hold both of those at once. I think that's entirely possible. Okay. What does this story say to you about what I called um, the rules of the game? Right. What, is, what does this story say about hermeneutics, you know, methods of interpretation, uh, methods of explanation of, of the text? And, and what makes a particular method valid or not?
I'm, I'm not sure this is an answer to your question, but I, I get the sense from the, the line about the Akiva being destined to derive from each and every thorn, mounds upon mounds of halahot, yeah. that, that there's a sense of infinity, that the interpretation will never be complete. Yeah. Um, that, that in being complete, Torah is also infinite. Otherwise, there would be boundaries around it, and there are no boundaries around it. Hmm. Um, yeah. That, uh. I mean, Kiva at this time is someone in the future. Right. And so both infinite time and infinite, um, that, we'll, that we will never know everything that's, that's there. So I think I think you're pointing to what what really the essential difference is between the sort of two possibilities about what revelation is is like if everything's already in there, it sort of necessarily must be finite, right? Mm -hmm. But if if there is flexibility built in, and we do get to be co participant co participants in revelation, then then the revelation can be infinite. You know, as long as there's people. You know, as long as there's new ideas and new approaches, like the, the revelation can, can be ongoing, right? So what I, what I was getting at with my question about, about hermeneutics and the rules of the game is like, well, okay, what actually are those, what actually are those crowns? They're like little artistic flourishes, right? Like they literally have no... They don't change the meaning of the word at all. Like if you were to write that same word in a different font, it would be the same word, right? But, but it seems like it's accepted by the story, right? Like it, it, this is not only, this is not bogus at all. Like Akiva is a genius for coming up with ways to make meaning out of these, these artistic flourishes. So those crowns are just like a scribal style. And like, yes, there's, there's a tradition about how to do it, um, it, I'm not a, a you know a sofer, so I can't tell you in extreme detail about you know how it goes and, and exactly how to do it. But I do know that there's actually not just one tradition about how to write those letters. So the, the Talmud seems to think that there was that the the Sefer Torah script, you know, uh, here I'll show. Let's illustrate while I'm talking. This style of writing. The Talmud seems to think that, that this script was standardized way back in the time of Ezra, which of course is probably not true, but that's sort of when they dated a lot of traditions that predated them. Um, but even the Talmud is not certain whether, you know, the, the previous style, which it calls Kitav Ivri, like Hebrew script, um, whether that was the old script and Ezra updated to, updated to this, which is called Kitav Ashuri, or whether, Kitab Ashuri was original and had gotten away from, and Ezra was getting back to that. So, like, even in the Talmud, it's not clear, you know, what the style was. And definitely over the last 2,000 years, when communities have lived apart, uh, variant traditions on how to write these letters have, have developed. So, today, what this style, what they call um, Kitab Ashuri, like literally Assyrian, Assyrian style writing is the only permissible style script, but there are there are two primary traditions within that. There's Kitab Ashkenazi, like Ashkenazi style, and Kitab Sephardi. And within Ashkenazi, there's two different possibilities. There's Kitab Beit Yosef, which is the standard. It's what's in our scrolls of Beit Am, and it's what this is. There's also Kitab Ha'ari, which is like the Hasidic style of doing it. I, I collected a bunch just to give you a sense of, of the differences I'm talking about. And when we're talking about crowns as being like valid focal points for deriving halakha, like literally for divining divine will. Check this out. So I found this on, um, if you ever go to Miodea, it's like a, it's a, like Judaism that stack, stack exchange dot org, something like that. There was a yeshiva booker asking about the Torah, asking about a particular Torah scroll and saying, is this kosher? Now, of course, the answer is probably no, because many of these letters are faded, but check out those, these pays right here. The little curly, the curly ends of the pays. We don't have that in our Torah scroll. It has, it has those little curls. And it, as it turns out, yes, um, 
that's one of the permissible uh, permissible um, you know sort of embellishments that you can you can choose to make. It's just not not commonly done, and actually, it's really not done anymore. This is this is an older style Torah scroll. The further back you go, the older your Torah is, the more likely it is you're going to have these different embellishments. Uh, here's another cool thing I found. So this is from a, a 13th century uh, Spanish Sefer Torah that was apparently sold at auction by Sotheby's in 2009. And it has um, extra tagin, extra, extra crowns. Uh, so for example, uh, these kufs, as it points out, have extra, extra little crowns on them. Uh, the, it has the spiral pays again. It has these curved islands with the little sort of bug you know, doodly antennas coming out of the iron. The shins, oh, the shins have seven different crowns on them. Look how many crowns are on these shins right here. And, you know, there's some up close uh, ones as well. So this is like a, an extra embellished Torah scroll way over and above what we have today. And in fact, this, story, this, this, this scroll was extra um, interesting because it would appear that a later scribe went back and added the more standardized crowns. Um, so you can see like on the ions and the tzadis, this is a different hand and a different stroke pattern and ink color that indicates that someone later went back and added crowns. If you're curious, the acronym to remember which letters get crowns is Shatnez Gets. So Shin, uh, Ayin, uh, Tet, Nun, Zion, Gimel, and Tzadi. So they went back and added those. <laughs> so back to my point. The if we're permitted to derive halakha from these from these crowns, then how do we account for the fact that they've changed over time? How can these be like reliable focal points, you know, hooks on which to hang valid interpretations of the divine will? Maybe it means we don't get to do like Rabbi Akiva did anymore. Like if if the if we've you know screwed up the the chain of tradition that says how these are supposed to be written, maybe we don't get to derive halakha from from crowns anymore. Maybe though, maybe it's a suggestion that actually the hermeneutic, the idea that we can the the sort of strategy um, for deriving meaning can change along with us and can change and evolve with us, and that and that. Whereas that was a valid hermeneutic for Rabbi Akiva, maybe in our era, there are different valid hermeneutics, different strategies for, for deriving meaning. So like, what's the difference between interpreting these crowns and uh, say, applying methods of, of you know, uh, critical scholarship, literary criticism or source criticism? Like maybe that's, maybe that's our, our era's hermeneutic that's sort of parallel to Rabbi Akiva's interpretation of crowns, it's still grounded in Torah. It's still authentic and from the text, like it's still wrestling with the, the real meaning of the words. Do you see this, this story? So that, that, was my, that was a long way of explaining my question. <laughs> Do you see the story as, as opening up new methods or, or more like closing them off? Methods of what? Uh, Hermeneutics, methods of interpretation, uh, strategies for deriving meaning from Torah. So I have to preface this with my attitude about rabbinical mm, picky detail borders on obsessive, in my opinion, and often <laughs> loses track of what I believe are core relevant features of Judaism. Okay. And uh, I, I have a vague memory of studying the Sanhedrin and the, the things that they went through when they did their translation mm -hmm. of the Septuagint. God, mm -hmm. I can't remember words. Anyways, Septuagint is the Greek translation of Torah. Right. Yeah. So I got it right. Okay. So what I remember distinctly in those classes was that the rabbis would argue over a single word out of context. They yeah. would argue over the most minutiae of things and trying to give it meaning. Yeah. And I think they lost perspective when they did that. Ah, so that's Rabbi Akiva though. That, uh, that is Rabbi Akiva's contribution to this, the idea that you can 
Look and at that's one, what one, I was looking one, one little word and derive world meaning. Yeah. yeah, and that's where I was going leading to. Good. So I mean, so I think you're absolutely right. Like the the sort of flip side or the 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 danger in opening up methods like that, where you can derive whole worlds of meaning from tiny little things, is like, yeah, maybe you can go too far. <laughs> And lose the point, lose the thread, or you know, get lost in the, you know, uh, in the weeds somehow. Yeah, I did want to finish, finish with my ad, my feeling about the crowns, uh -huh. which I grew up. The, my feeling about the crowns, which by the way, when I grew up, they were called thorns. Um, yeah, that, that's the text here has coats, like they call each one of those a thorn, not a coat. Yeah. Right. So uh -huh. um, I always thought that it was simply a matter of scriber style. I think basically, yeah. So we have serifs in, in English literature, which is equivalent in terms of making it more or less fancy. Right, right. right. I'm done. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a really funny thing to, to say, yeah, that's, it's valid to interpret those because, I mean, people can change them. People can kind of make, make them up. But the story seems to say, yeah, those two are expressions of divine will and you can derive halakha from them. Okay, I think that I'm not. I'm not sure what this one means. I I really am motivated to see this as authorizing me. I think personally to pursue new and different methods of 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 explanation interpretation. I really like critical methods of reading Torah. Um, you know, it sort of speaks to me as a sort of scientist and a rationalist and a critical thinker. I think the, the crown stuff is kind of bogus too, in a way. So I really want this to read as, as authorizing me to pursue new strategies that are that are right for me. Because I'm not I'm not Akiva, right? And I'm not Moses either. And actually, that's kind of where I think I, I wanna to have us wrap up is with one more question. What does this story say about us? None of us is Moses, none of us is Akiva. Are our insights, are our interpretations legitimate, authoritative, the way these guys were? How can we know? I would have a rhetorical question. Why okay. not? It, why not indeed? We're, we're, we're human beings like they are. They were. Well, Kibo, he was almost certainly historical. Moses, that's, that's anyone's guess, I suppose, but... Yeah, I think uh, it, it leaves it open to uh, interpretation in general by by whoever. This whole thing kind of reminds me of the Supreme Court and uh, the originalists oh. and how they interpret, um, you know, um, the law as opposed to people that are that are continually uh, other people on the court that are reading right. into things right. that aren't explicitly stated. Right. Yeah. Actually, that. In my preparation for this, I sort of hit on that idea that sort of, is there such a thing as like biblical originalism? I think there are people who would, you know, try to claim yes. I'm not so sure. I think this story is trying to, is, is actually kind of saying like, no, there's, the point is actually not the original intention. The process of interpretation, you know, what, what Rachel talked about where the sort of co-participation in interpretation is actually the important thing. And it's not about a search for original meaning or whatever was originally intended. It's about figuring out how to apply it, you know, for our needs now. Lisa. I I get the sense, especially in the kind of amusement in the second um, verse there, mm -hmm. that this feels like there's an, Im an invitation, an invitation yeah. to yeah. interpret. Yeah. It's almost like if I don't make it infinitely interesting how is it going to hold people's interest for right. Right. millennia right therefore i will make it infinitely interesting and people will be wondering and the more they wonder the more the more engaged they'll be i like that too i think that's part that's part of the appeal for me the idea that there's infinite infinity to explore there and that and that i get to and i get to do it right I get to have access. Yeah, yeah, Rachel. I guess I would say I think there's a a, a, a medium between 
you know, I mean, if we, if we, if, if we go too far in one direction where well, we can read anything into it and I don't think right. that's what's intended or right. that's what's good. Right. I mean, and our challenge is to find that middle way mm -hmm. between, um, the originalist quote unquote text right. and how it speaks to us today. Right. Yeah. It can't, it can't be just totally out of the field. Yeah. That feels like it's, I mean, that's dangerous. Right? <laughs> You know, I, I've tried to explain this to, to like kids before um, when talking about what what midrash even is. You know, you you can't you can't just say that like Abraham was a space alien or something because <laughs> like that that's just way outside the bounds of anything, right? That's clearly that's clearly too far. You're clearly making up your own stuff, but like you can make up stuff about the city of Ur where he where it says he's from. You can make anything you want about what went on in Ur because it doesn't say, right? That feels like it's within the rules of the game. Were you asking me to, were you to, you know, try to ask me to write down what are all the acceptable inside the bounds, inside the rules interpretations? I don't think I could do that. It's like, it's not, it's not a clear line like that. But when you know, you know, I feel like. Thank you, everybody. So I, I want to make, Two, two sort of closing, uh, two, two closing thoughts. So, one is I think it was Susan um, hit on you know that that word that, that Akiva is destined to derive that like focused on the word derive from each and each and every thorn and and sort of read into that a process of you know sort of participation not not just decoding but like actively you know adding something to the process and the word that's translated derive is lidrosh which is the same root as midrash, uh, you know, or to give a drash. It, it means to seek. And you don't seek anything by decoding it. Like seeking is an active process. You have to decide where to look. And you decide, have to decide how to look and what, your, what sort of lens you're going to look and are you, what senses you're going to look to, or you're going to use for, uh, use to try to, to seek something out. So I think that is actually implicit in the, in the Hebrew, in the root there. And, um, you know, lastly, it, it occurred to me that I think there's, there, for, for folks in a town that's full of scientists, I feel like everyone I meet in this, in this, the town of Corvallis is a scientist. Like, I think there's kind of a way that we're all like scientific researchers in the Torah here. You know, no, no scientist is ever certain that they've understood all the secrets of whatever it is they're studying. They don't have any objective reference frame for that. And a later generation can come and through research, you know, contradict previous scientific instructions. So, so too, researchers in the Torah, at whatever level we're at, you know, can we claim that we've considered all the possibilities? No, but no one can. Not even Akiva could have. Not even Moses could have. So can anyone ever be certain they've, they've discovered the original meaning, the, the true intention of Torah? I think all we can really do is, is to do our best with what we have. And that is both... Uh, you know, intimidating and also also exciting and, and definitely keeps it fresh and interesting and compelling. So thank you all so much for, for learning this, this story with me. As I said, this is one of my favorites for, I think because it speaks to, you know, deep questions about the nature of revelation and our, and our place in you know, the process of revelation. And because it's a great story, it's got some awesome sort of magic teleportation and a great ending. Um, I'm really looking forward to, to doing some more learning of, of stories in Talmud with all of you. Thank you all so much. Uh, you're free to go, but uh, if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to stay around and chat.